Let's pray before we begin and dig into God's word, shall we? Father, we come now to your word and, and we, we confess that we need your Holy Spirit to speak to us and open our minds to understand it. And we ask in the name of Jesus, who is the living word made flesh, that you would help us understand your written word, that we might live according to it. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you a question. What's making the ribbons move? Ah. Some, you might say, well, the fan's making them move. Duh. Yes, in a way it is. Or maybe specifically the fan blades are making them move. You might say, electricity's making the, 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 the ribbons move because without that, you can't power the fan. I heard some of you mumble that there's another element at work here. It's the movement of the air. And that's right because neither the, the fan blades aren't touching the ribbons. They're moving because of the movement of the air. In John chapter 3, Jesus says... The wind blows where it wills. Nobody knows where it's going or where it's coming from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We're beginning a series on the Holy Spirit. Talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and why that matters. And it's not just because I get a little hot out of the collar I, that I wanted to fan up here, but as, a, as we go through the series, I just wanted that to be a, a visual reminder for you that the Spirit's moving. Kent had mentioned a moment ago that it's, the, the red would symbolize the Spirit's presence, the Spirit's moving. I don't think we live with that awareness very often, at least I don't, often enough. What do you think of when you hear the word Holy Spirit? Some of you might have grown up in a church where you didn't talk about the Spirit much. And in fact, you were suspicious of those who talked about the Spirit too much. It was all head, no heart. Some of you might have been around a church or grown up in circles where you talked about the Spirit all the time. Filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, moved by the Spirit. You're comfortable with that. And I'm guessing a lot of you, and my experience is for a lot of folks, you don't know what to think. So you don't think much about the Spirit at all. And that is a shame. I have a friend who's a pastor who said, the Holy Spirit's like your crazy uncle. You never know when he's going to show up at family gatherings. It's unpredictable. It's kind of fun, but he makes everybody feel awkward too. There's some truth in that, but it's not exactly, I think, the way we ought to think about the Holy Spirit. For most of us, I think, we just don't know exactly. We know about God the Father, at least we think we do. We know about God the Son. We celebrated His resurrection last weekend. But the Holy Spirit, nah, I don't know. I'll just take two out of three. It's not bad. This is a shame. I'm learning that this is a real shame. And we lack, we will not be who God wants us to be as men and as women and as a church if we don't grow an understanding of the Spirit and take Him seriously. In his book, Forgotten God, Francis Chan, uh, that wrote that a number of years ago, and the title is, is maybe an overstatement, but it's certainly an ignored God. He talks about the Holy Spirit. He asked this question, he said, if all you had on a deserted island was your Bible, you knew nothing else about Christianity, the Christian life, or Christian faith, or God, except for the Word of God, and all you had was the Bible to read on a deserted island, how different would your conception of the Spirit and the Christian life be if all you read was this? I think it'd be different, wouldn't it? I think it'd be very different. In fact, when you read the story of the Bible, you're struck by how much of this, it's just the Spirit is all over everything that's happening there. In the Old Testament, the primary word used for Spirit, now, now I didn't think of this through ahead of time. This is going to blow my notes off of the stand, so I'm going to turn off the Spirit. I'm not turning off the Spirit, I'm just turning off the fan. I'll make sure that you don't get confusion there. The Spirit's still moving, even if the fan's not. The Old Testament word for Spirit is the Hebrew word ruach. Everybody, let me hear everybody say ruach. You have to sound like you're choking at the end if you want to say it speaking good Hebrew. Holy Spirit is Ruach HaKodesh. But this word Ruach can mean wind, breath, or spirit interchangeably throughout the story of the Old Testament. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, at the very beginning of creation, when the earth was being formed, the earth was without form and it was void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Ruach of God was hovering over the face of the water. And then Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the story of the forming of the first man and woman. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the ruach of life. And the man became a living thing. In fact, last night at the Christ in the Cosmos, the question was asked, how do we get something from nothing? How does life come from non-life? And we had to admit that that's one of the ones that science can't answer, but theology can. God did it, breathing the breath of ruach animating us, bringing us to life. And in Job 33, verse 4, 
The Ruach of God has made me, and the Ruach of God Almighty gives me life. And in Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the Ruach of his mouth all their host. The Spirit of God is present before creation. The Spirit of God is active in creation. The Spirit of God is giving life to non-life, bringing us to life. The Spirit of God is making all that exists. All throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God is at work. And this is important because when we come to the New Testament and we hear Jesus teaching on the Spirit, which we're going to do in just a moment, it's important that you know he's not doing something brand new. He's not inventing something that wasn't there before. The Spirit of God has always been. The Holy Spirit has been there. Now we're going to come to this section called Uh, in John chapter 14 in a moment called the Upper Room Discourse or the Farewell Discourse of Jesus. A little background here. We're backing up now from Easter to before the crucifixion. Jesus is at the Last Supper in the Upper Room with his disciples. And from John, John 13 talks about the Supper itself. In John 17 is Jesus' great high priestly prayer. In John 14, 15, and 16 is this discourse, this conversation Jesus has with his disciples. And you know what the primary, there's two primary subjects in that conversation. You know what they are? Number one, I'm going to go away. Number two, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. Think about that. How important is that? For the life of the believer, the follower of Christ. He knows this is the last meal. He's soon to be betrayed, arrested, put on trial, crucified, and killed. And he wants to talk to his disciples. And the two things he wants to say is, I'm going to leave you. But the Spirit's going to come. I mean, what could be more important for us as the church today? To understand this. Let's look at John chapter 14, verses 15 through 16. Jesus, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, For he dwells in you, dwells with you, and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. We'll stop there, although it goes on for another two chapters on this issue. Again, the setting, Jesus is with his, his disciples in the upper room here. In fact, Jesus seems to say both that he's going away and that he's coming to them. Did you catch that? I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come to you. I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. How can Jesus go away and not go away? How can Jesus both go away from them and come to them? How is that possible? This is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And and in fact, in verse 28, he says, You heard me say, I'm going away, and I'll come to you. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? How could that be possible? In his book, Rediscovering the Holy Spirit, theologian and pastor Michael Horton, it's a a fantastic treatment of these passages. He says, um, he writes in his book, that in the farewell discourse, Jesus is talking about what he calls the divine trading of places. Trading places is the name of a bad movie in the 80s, but that's not what I'm talking about. He's going to be, he's talking about, I'm going to trade places with the Holy Spirit. Jesus and the Holy Spirit tr- swapping places and roles in the life of the believer. Jesus with us, with them, and the Spirit now in them. Let's look at verses 16 and 26 again together. These are the sort of the central verses I want you to see as the promise of the Holy Spirit in this text. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Verse 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. These statements, by the way, are made 
in a, is a kind of answer from Jesus to this like, deep misunderstanding and anxiety in the disciples. You know, they're having this conversation. We didn't read all this part, but at one point, at the end of chapter 13, beginning of chapter 14, Thomas pipes up at the dinner. Think about it for a minute. Jesus is talking, right? I would just be quiet and listen. But Thomas speaks up, and he says, Jesus says, I'm going away, and you know where I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? To which Jesus gives his famous answer in 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas goes, "Uh, okay. (laughs) And then Philip chimes in. And, and you'd think that this would answer it. And Philip goes, well, could you just show us the Father? Like, if you're going away, show us the Father. And Jesus almost sounded like he's exasperated and says, I've been with you this whole time, and you're still asking me that? How can you ask me, show us the Father? And maybe I'm reading into it too much, but it sounds like Jesus is like, ah, oh, these guys. <laughs> In that context, this fundamental misunderstanding of who Jesus even is and what he's saying, Jesus says to them, I'm, I'm, going, I'm not leaving you alone. The Spirit's going to come. This whole struggle by the disciples to grasp where Jesus is going, what he's saying, and who he is, it, in, a, in a way it gives me encouragement. I hope it does to you. Those closest to Jesus failed to understand at times who he was, what he was doing, and where he was going. You ever feel that way? I believe in you, but I just don't understand why you're not addressing this or why you're doing this. So did those that walked with him physically. This is critical, by the way, to understanding this role of the Spirit in your life. The role of the Spirit in your life is fundamentally to help you understand who Jesus is, what he's doing. Verse 16 is translated, I'll ask the Father and he will send you another helper. This is a really important phrase for you to understand. That's the Greek words, alos parakletos. Uh, I wish we had both screens working, but you can see it over there. Alos means another, but there's two Greek words you can use for another. One is heteros. Perhaps you know that prefix. Heteros means another that's different from. Alos means another of the same kind. Jesus is saying, I'm sending another helper that's like the first helper. And Sinclair Ferguson in his Doctrine of the Holy Spirit says, the key to understanding the second helper is to understanding the first helper. He's like Jesus. That's how Jesus can say, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going away, but I'm coming to you. Another of the same kind. Now, paraclete is sometimes translated comforter, but that makes Jesus sound like, or the Holy Spirit sound like a quilt. I don't think that's right. Counselor, but not like a camp counselor, not like a therapist. Uh, Comforter, counselor, helper. The word literally means advocate. One who is with you and for you and on your side. Jesus says to his disciples, You're going to receive another helper who is with you and for you, and he's just like me. Now, we don't need another Jesus. We have one Redeemer. There's one mediator between God and man. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one payment for sin. There's one Jesus. And that's been done. But we do need an advocate. You need another helper like him to remind you of him, to teach you about him, to help you follow him. That's what Jesus is saying. Because think of the disciples, they're going, now, right now, you're leaving us when we need you most? And Jesus is saying, well, yes and no. In fact, next week we're going to learn that it's actually better for them and for us that he goes away. But we'll save that for next week in John 16. Another like him to help you understand him and love him. This means, by the way, the Holy Spirit's not a force. It's not a power you tap into. It's not like Star Wars. There's not a dark side and a light side. The Holy Spirit is a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises us not a force or a feeling, but a person, the third person of the Godhead. I I think it's important just to pause for a minute here and remind you that the Holy Spirit is neither a force nor a feeling. Now, intellectually, I know a lot of Christians who would say, yeah, that's right, I agree. But you behave as if he is. We live as if it's a force that's mysterious and you don't understand. Or a feeling. I've met so many believers, uh, old and young, who think of their Christian life as in terms of how they feel in a given moment. I don't feel close to God. 
I don't feel the way I used to feel. And I understand that. Let me, let me offer you what C.S. Lewis says about this. In a letter he wrote to a good friend, uh, actually uh, not a good friend, a, a, a young woman who wrote to him about her conversion to faith and her concern over, her, over this feeling fading. Lewis, by the way, personally responded to every letter he ever received ha- by handwritten note. And those are collected in three volumes, massive volumes. They're fantastic spiritual uh, wealth there in these letters. Think about that. I hardly even email two words back sometimes. Every letter he ever received. Here's what he writes to this young woman. It is quite right that you should feel that something terrific has happened to you, and it has, and that you should be all glowy inside. Accept these sensations with thankfulness as birthday cards from God. I love that line. But remember, they are only the greetings, not the real gift. I mean, it is not the sensations that are the real thing. The real thing is the gift of the Holy Spirit, which cannot usually be and perhaps not ever experienced only as a sensation or an emotion. The sensations are merely the response of your nervous system to what God is doing in your heart. Don't depend on them. Otherwise, when they go, and you are once more emotionally flat, as you certainly will be, you might think the real thing has gone too. But he won't, ever. He'll be there when you cannot feel him. And maybe even most operative in your life when you least feel him. I love that. It's so true. If you make out the sensations, the feelings in the moment, the emotions of the moment to be how you connect with God, when those emotions go, you think God is gone. And are your emotions fickle? Mine are. Like right now, you have this emotion. (laughs) Do your emotions change? I could eat a bad taco and I could feel different tomorrow. It changes, right? I could, you, they come and go. We're up and down. We're, we're not constant people. We're, we're easily d- distracted and forgetful, and we are swayed, and we're prone to like extremes sometimes. You cannot define go- the God of the universe by how you feel in a moment. You define it by what he said to you. Jesus, these disciples are feeling fearful. Jesus is saying, I'm not leaving you alone. He's going to be with you. And there are going to be moments in your life when you feel feel full of the Spirit, full of joy, full of courage, and full of power. There are going to moments when you feel just as flat as can be, and you wonder if you're praying to the wall, if anybody's listening. But he's never leaving you. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. Did you hear that? You're not alone. Ever. The, the Bible's quite clear about the person of the Holy Spirit. We're told in James 4 that the Spirit can envy in Ephesians 4, that he can be grieved. And in, in, in Hebrews 10, that he can be angered. And in Romans 15, that he can be moved with compassion. These are personality traits. Why is this important? That the Spirit's a person. Why does it matter to you? When the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being challenged by the Spirit, being convicted by the Spirit, how different is that from thinking, I'm filled with a force? I'm convicted by a force, an impersonal force. No, no, you're filled with a person. You're consumed with a person. You're, fill, you're convicted by a person. You're challenged by a person. You're led by a person. Think about this for a minute. If, if the Spirit is a force, when you have a tough decision to make in your life and you're wrestling through God, what do you want me to do? What do you do? Do you, do you pray and ponder and then get out the Christian Magic 8 Ball? Remember the Magic 8 Ball, anybody? You could Google it, kids. Right? And go, oh, Lord, guide me with my decision. Like it's, it's not personal. You're just, you're just shooting in the dark. But think about how you go to a friend. You pray and you ponder and you go to a a good friend and you say to your friend, help me, pray with me, pray for me. They offer you wise counsel. They ask you good questions. They cross-examine you perhaps. They pray with you. and you, you, You receive peace about your decision from that relationship. That's why it matters. The Spirit's not some hocus pocus thing floating around in the ether of the Christian life. It's the person of God. It's the divine personal resident in the heart of every believer. Everyone who's in Christ has a divine personal resident. Now, you might not be paying attention. You might not be aware. You might not be listening. But that's what this series is about. But it's true. And it's crucial to your life with Christ. You can't be the man or woman God made you to be without the work of the Spirit in your life. It can't happen. I hope you realize what this means. If you think about this, what is Jesus saying here? Let's go back to what we talked about at the beginning. 
that the Ruach of God, the Greek word is pneuma, we get like a pneumatic from there, it's like it can mean wind, breath, or spirit, or air again. He says the Ruach of God, the creating, animating, life-giving, power of God at work in the Holy Spirit from creation and the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That Holy Spirit is the divine resident in the heart of everyone who believes. I'm going to make a confession to you. I like to read books. Does that surprise you? (laughs) I like to study. And I felt convicted in preparation for this series. Most of my knowledge of the Spirit is book learning. I suppose someone who's Learned it shouldn't say book learning, but anyway. Like I read about it, but I want more of the Spirit in my life. I want more than just head knowledge. I want more of what God wants to give me, not, not just intellectually, but I want to f- live in the power of the Spirit. I want us to do that. I want you to experience that. The, 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 I mentioned the divine personal residence in your life. When I was a kid, we had people come over, guests come over to our house. We called it having company over. Anybody remember that phrase? Let's have company over. Like, for example, I, I saw this comedian recently. I for, I've forgotten his name. He's an Italian guy. But he, he talked about the difference between answering the doorbell today and 25 years ago. 25 years ago, when the doorbell rang, you know, it was like a competition. Who can go answer it? Somebody's here. My sister and I would run and fight to see who got to welcome the guests. We didn't know who it was. We were excited. Today, what happens in your house the doorbell rings? Shh, don't move. Right? <laughs> Did you invite somebody over? Who's that? probably somebody selling something. Just pretend like we're not home, right? You crawl around the floor even, right? <laughs> well, it's different, isn't it? But when I was a kid, we had company over to our house. And this was both good news and bad news for a 10-year-old boy. The good news was, hey, somebody's coming over. This is kind of fun. We'll, we'll eat well. The bad news was, we have to clean everything. Did anybody grow up like this? Top to bottom, places we had to dust that had not been dusted in, in, in months. My mom didn't care about them. Suddenly, you've got to dust that. Like our guests are going to go behind the TV. What's, what's this, you know? <laughs> we had to clean the whole house. And we, she said, you have to be on your best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> what fun is that? Okay, all kidding aside. The Spirit of God is the divine resident in your life, in your heart. Not a sometime guest. Not coming over and leaving now and then. But a permanent resident in your life. How different would your life be? Would your behavior be? If, you just, if, if, noth- if, it, if nothing else, you live with an awareness of who resides in you, of who lives in you. My life would be different. I would behave differently. I think you would as well. That's not, I don't hear this as a guilt trip about, you know, you better behave. I mean, just if we live with an awareness of the one who lives in us, we would be different. If nothing else, we'd be different. That's what the Apostle Paul means in 1 Corinthians 6 when he's talking about sexual immorality. He says, don't you know? You're bought with a price. You don't belong to you. You're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Or don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? I just don't think we grasp the incredible significance and implications of what Jesus is saying to us. At least I don't often enough. In verse 21, he says, I'll manifest myself to him. He means show myself to him. Now, this is curious if, you think, if you're thinking about what's going on here. Jesus is sitting at the table with the disciples. They're having dinner, closer than we are to each other. And he says, I will show myself to you. Uh, I'm looking at you, Jesus. I'm, I'm listening to you. We're face to face. What do you mean you'll show yourself to me? Didn't they already see him? Didn't they live with him every day for three years? Weren't they at the table with him right now? What does he mean? I'll show myself to you. What Jesus is saying here is very profound, both for the disciples and for us as disciples today. He's saying, you will know me through the Holy Spirit in a way you cannot know me in the flesh. You ever think about How many of you have wondered at time to time, like, if I could have just walked with Jesus, if I could have seen a miracle firsthand, my faith would be stronger. Ever thought that? Jesus is saying, actually, not, not so. Actually, you will have a knowledge of me, an intimacy with me, and a relationship with me by the Holy Spirit that you can't have. Jesus, the Spirit of God in you is better than the Son of God next to you. Do you believe that? We'll talk about that again next week. This is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lastly, the presence. So it's a promise. It's, he's a person, the divine resident, and his, he's, pres- he's resident for what? 
to be present with you. How is the Holy Spirit present with us? In what way? For what purpose? Again, the Greek word parakletos or paraklete is too rich and complex for one English word to capture it all. That's why we have these different versions and translations of it. But it's a compound word. Para meaning with, and kletos meaning a clear calling or called. Called to be with, in other words, is what the word actually translates to. And the best use of it in Greek, the best understanding of it, is more like a legal advocate. Now, in our culture, you say lawyer. That's not like, I don't want a lawyer, as a, you know, unless a lawyer means you're in trouble. We don't trust lawyers for some reason. But w- what the word means is someone who's on your side in a legal sense. Let me try to explain this to you. Years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine who is a, was an attorney, and he was uh, in a, cor- a civil cor- a suitcase defending two of our mutual friends. And I, I went to hear the closing arguments because he invited me. I sat in the courtroom. I listened to my friend, the attorney, make uh, beautiful, rational closing arguments to defend our friends. And I remember thinking, in the whole, and this is, what, this is what the Spirit does. He argues. He makes an argument. But it's a legal argument. Meaning, meaning I, uh, for many of us, I think we feel this way. Romans 8 says that Jesus always lives to make intercession for those who belong to him. Meaning the Son of God is before the Father interceding for you. Here's how most of you think that works. Jesus is up there in heaven going, well, I know that he's screwed up again, but I kind of like him, so could you give him one more break, Dad? I know Jeff is a complete buffoon, and it's like the 500th time I've had to ask for this, but could you just let him off the hook? Could you just be merciful to him one more time? That is not how it works. What is Jesus saying before the Father? I died on the cross for his sin. It's paid in full. It would be unjust to punish him for what I have paid for. That's the argument. And you know what the Spirit then is doing in you? So Jesus is your advocate in heaven. The Spirit is your advocate in your heart on earth. The Spirit is telling you that that's happening. The Spirit is telling you that's true. You're free. It's forgiven. It's paid for. You have a new life. You're, his, you're my son. You're my daughter. You belong to me. You're not the old self. You're the new self. Walk in the Spirit. That's what it means, walk in the Spirit. It's not hocus pocus floating around doing miracles necessarily. It's meaning walk in the freedom Jesus gives, right? I paid for your sin. It's covered. You belong to me. And the son is before the Father constantly interceding for you. On a, not, not on the basis of mercy, like let him off again, God, because you're nice, but because it's just. Because it's paid for. And the Spirit is the divine resident in your heart saying to you, you belong to Jesus. You belong to me. You're free. It's forgiven. Don't go back to that old life. Don't fall back into guilt and shame. Don't you need an advocate like that? Hey, I know this is the traditional campus and you don't actually answer out loud, but do you need an advocate like that? How many of you, how many of you are fine, you don't need that? We all need that. The, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 that even when our hearts condemn us, he is greater than our hearts. He argues for us, sometimes cross-examines us, defends us against ourselves even. The primary work of the Spirit is not the stuff people tend to focus on. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and all of that in this series. But the primary purpose of the Spirit is not the stuff people get tripped up on. It's not miraculous healings or speaking in tongues or doing mer- mysterious things. The primary work of the Spirit is in your heart, in your character, in your life, to help you believe with all of your being that you belong to Jesus and to live that way. To bring glory to God by making you like the Son. That's the number one job of the Spirit. That's why he lives in you. That's why Jesus said, I'm going away, but it's going to be good. Don't worry, it's going to be good, because I've got a job to do in heaven on your behalf, and I'm sending one to do the same job in your heart here on earth. When that came home to me, it changed things. We're not just shuffling through life here on earth, you know, hoping we get to heaven someday. Jesus is working on our behalf in heaven, and he'll return someday in glory. And in the meantime, he's given us the divine personal resident, which is essentially him in us. I don't even know where I am in the notes. <laughs> Jesus Christ, your advocate in heaven before the Father. The Spirit, your advocate in your heart here on earth. Working together beautifully, perfectly. Applying the reality of Christ to your heart. Truth is, we all stand accused before the bar of God's justice. There is a reckoning. 
Who will be our advocate? Who will defend us? Jesus Christ, the righteous, and his Holy Spirit in your heart. Man, I want that. I want you to live in that. Every day, not just once a week on Sunday when you show up and you're reminded, but every day, the freedom that brings. Now, I, again, I confess to you that most of my experience of the Spirit is in head knowledge. And in preparation for this series, every, ta- every time a pastor prepares, if they're paying attention, I think, God's teaching me as well as he's teaching you, hopefully. As I prepare to teach you, God is teaching me. One of the things he's teaching me is, you don't get this yet. You've got some growing to do, Jeff. So I want to embrace that the same as you. Let's pray together. Father God, we we confess to you that we're small-minded and forgetful people, and you are the sovereign king of the universe. You're Lord of all creation. And somehow, mysteriously, beautifully, wonderfully, you promise to be present with us in your Holy Spirit. I think for many of us, we live just in ignorance of that. We're not living in the power and freedom that brings. But I know in my heart, God, you want us to walk in the Spirit, in the freedom of knowing we belong to you, in the power of knowing who resides in our hearts. You want all your children in your church all over the world to live that way. That is the greatest testimony the world could ever see and hear. So we ask you, God, to open our minds, awaken our hearts, help us to to embrace what you want to give. We pray this in your name, for your sake, and by the power of your Holy Spirit.